Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Page Turners Plus. As always, we thank you for joining us and for following us. Uh, we usually give the <clears throat> title of the novel that we'll be reflecting on for the following month so that you could keep track and read along with us. Today, we'll be reflecting on Jacqueline Crook's Fire Rush. To tell you a bit more about Jacqueline Crook's debut novel, we have Paula. Thank you, Raul J. Jacqueline Crooks was born in Jamaica and raised in England. Fire Rush is her first novel. It is a story of death and rebirth. Yamaye is a second generation Jamaican born in England to Windrush migrants. She's raised on Tombstone Estate, a housing project sited next to a decommissioned graveyard known as Resurrection. When we meet Yamaye, she's in a state of psychic purgatory. She's 24 years old, working in a dead-end job, and Margaret Thatcher's England is hostile to poor people in general, and Black people in particular. She and other youth from her community seek refuge from the hostility in a dance hall known as the Crypt. The Crypt is no through way to heaven, but it is there that a vision of paradise will be revealed to her. Before she can capitalize on it, the vision is snatched away and she descends into a state of hell. Yamaye must either capitulate to horror or claw her way out of Hades, one palm full of graveyard dust at a time. So I guess we could jump right in. So this is the second novel we've read, which is grounded in reggae aesthetic. Do you think this novel is more closely related to Marcia Douglas's The Marvelous Equations of the Dread? than to other novels we've read together. I think I could start because I did the audiobook for this novel and the fact that they intertwined um, reggae beats, reggae music into the, the audiobook demonstrated that this was the intention of the author. And then when we had, I didn't do the audiobook for, for um, Marvelous Equations of the Dread. I don't think there is one, but when we had Marcia Douglas and she did the reading then I think the reggae aesthetic became even clearer. And I think now I could see that both novels are, are quite similar in terms of being grounded in the reggae aesthetic. What do you think? What do the others think? There is an audiobook for The Marvelous Equation of the Dread, and it is done by Marcio. Um, and it is very rhythmic. Um, I started reading, uh, sorry, listening to the audiobook for this one, but I didn't get a chance to finish it. Um, apart from the reggae aesthetic, though, I didn't see that it was. I didn't see that it was particularly closely um, connected or more related to the marvelous equations of the dread than to other novels. Um, I think the concerns of this novel are very similar to most other Car most of the Caribbean literature that we have read. Uh, yeah, things. I agree. Um, sorry, Kesawa. Um, definitely the reggae aesthetic. And I know when I talked about it, a friend of mine said she wanted to read it. And then I told her that she should also read Marvelous Equations of the Dread. But for me, I think one of the books that I'm kind of reminded of when, when reading this one was, um, Monster in the Middle for something, there's something about those two stories that felt similar to me, you know, a young woman kind of trying to find herself so to speak so i think that's one of the other ones that came to mind as i read fire rush that is interesting that's not the novel i would have gone for um the novel that i thought this was clearly close your mind of wasn't one of the ones that we've read collectively actually uh, it's actually another british novel um by a british Ghanaian author caleb azuma nelson open water i think eric has read it i think fancy might have we've talked about i've it. also read it yeah okay so everybody's gonna read it then uh, yeah yeah you're right um, you're right mm -hmm. and the lyricism of the novel um really it really really strongly remind me of that novel actually um and the, the kind of beauty and the writing um and the sensation i think of 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 listening to something not a novel that's it's, it's just got it's got poetry to it and it's, it's called right. it's kind of own beat it was it felt less musical to me i also listened to the audiobook um and although it had the nice musical interludes, um, I didn't get the, the. I think Re Marvelous Equations is a really different novel as an audiobook, I think, um, compared to this. This is much more of a straight fiction novel, I think, in ways that Marvelous Equations isn't. 
would be what, how I'd answer that question. Well, Roger, I don't do audiobooks. Um, <laughs> put it, unfortunately. Um, so reading, the vibe that I got, yeah, so the reggae aesthetic is, is definitely um, thematic through both novels, but I, I'm getting a vibe of dub poetry from this one, Farish, um, as opposed to the style or the, the genre of reggae. You know, reggae is has several genres, right? So the genre of reggae that's coming through in in marvelous equations of the dread. So I they're not similar stories to me. Okay. Um although there's that general theme of reggae but um, i i think that's just about the only similarity to me but i also must um say that i i really liked um the fact that they used um the reggae interludes as, as guess who mentioned um and i think I'm, I'm starting to like caribbean books that do audiobooks like this because i could think back to even though it's a different genre uh anthony joseph's um i can't remember the name of it but we did it <laughs> Um, his Anthony Joseph's latest novel, I can't remember the name of it, but I, I did like the, the, the use of music to tell the story because the pitch, the rhythm, it all gives a story. And, and from the audiobook, I picked up that. Um, in the this frequency book. of magic. The frequency of magic, yes. Thank you very much. So, yeah, that was epic. It was. <laughs> so, we can focus a bit more on the main character of this novel. Is Yamaye the author of her own misfortunes? <laughs> Kesua, <laughs> I see the eyes. Paula? Yes, and um, but no more, no more so than all of us are the authors of our own misfortune. Um, I, when I say she's the author of her own misfortunes, I don't mean to cast blame as much as I mean to just you know, say that all of us have to take responsibility for our, our own choices. It doesn't mean that our choices are not understandable and not forgivable. Um, there were enormous red flags uh, to warn her about Manasa, and she ignored them. Um, but she was in a state, she was grieving when she met Manasa, and she was vulnerable. And I have made mistakes like that. I have seen red flags and ignored them. I think all human beings do because we want what we want, even if it's not good for us. So um, yeah, I, I do say that she's the author of her own misfortune, but I am not judging. I would I disagree. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, uh, early on when she's thinking about her relationship with Manasseh, she thinks that what they have in common is they don't know they've never loved and they've never been loved. And to have never experienced love as the kind of early 20s point, I think that we, we meet her in, that's not your own fault. If you didn't have a childhood where you felt loved and you were taught to give and receive love, then that's not your fault. That's the, that's the environment that you grew up in. And so if that's, the, if that's the trigger or that's the catalyst for you making choices that then, you know, create problems, if your friendships are you don't have a model for friendships and so you have friendships that are unhealthy or you, you you choose poorly because you don't have good models then i don't think that's your fault um so i think i would say no she's not the author of her choices she's she's the author of her choices yes but if she's given such a limited range of good options to choose from and chooses badly like how many of us can make good choices against the odds i, I think I, it's too hard to say it's too unfair it's too unfair to say that she's the author of her own demise. I and going back to that. Paula's synopsis of, of the book, um, I'm taking it from a, a point of view of how much is she a victim of the system. Um, and I think that also plays in the narrow options that she has, uh, Kessel, as you pointed out. Um, so so there's the, 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 the problems from her not being loved, uh, you know, not coming up in a house of a household of love. So there's that. But her parents were also system victims. Um, you know, again in Paula's synopsis, she mentioned the wind rush, um, and we we know that um, era of history. Um, so I, I think 
it's a question of options. Um, the, the limited range, as, as you put it, of options. And um, any choice is a bad choice, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I feel like she was she was between a rock and a hard place, basically. Like, you know, it was not just not just grieving. Well, she was yeah grieving for for various different options. Her mother, Moose, as what happened with Asazi. She lost rumor as well. So she, I don't know, she didn't know where to turn, and so she just did the thing that seemed would help her at that point in time. I could see Kessler's point and in, in disagree with Paul, but I, I still agree with Paul in the sense that it's almost like erasure poetry. You're given words <laughs> and you have to choose your words from, from that word salad that you've been given. And so in the end, she is, still is the author of her own misfortunes. It's not like Yamaye was this person who couldn't discern right from wrong. She was dealt a hand, yes, through um, her relationship with her father, etc., the friend she chose, but at the end of the day, she still was old enough to discern right from wrong, and she she was the author of her misfortunes. That's that's how I see it. I <laughs> yeah, but I mean, talking about that, right? Yeah, because okay, being able to discern right from wrong and then doing the right thing is, I think, is a matter of privilege. Well, not being able to discern, but actually being able to make the right choice. We can say that's a matter of privilege. If you have the privilege to make what would be the right choice, great. But if you don't have that, then you have to do whatever you can do in that moment. And I think that's what she did. I mean, she was literally, she was fatherless, homeless, jobless. I mean, <laughs> she didn't have a lot of choice in the matter and, and there's and a lot more going on, on, on there too. Fabulous, homeless, top, top, jobless. she was also without good role models but adults around her her father was one Correct. but even Asase's mum who was the closest thing she had to a mother chose Asase when it wasn't the right thing to do Correct. she never had anybody who was out for her who, who modelled something that could resemble integrity Correct. right so she and was in a difficult she, environment and the closest thing she had to that I think was I'm going to get his name wrong Eustace Right, yes. and look what happened to Eustace. Shop, um, he was also taken oh. away from yes, her absolutely. against her will. Right, mm -hmm. the closest thing she had to somebody like that was Eustace, or maybe Herbert. Right, and so she she was really really until she got to Jamaica. I think Jamaica was very different for her, and I like that 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 was a point in the story that that you know options completely changed right. and, mm -hmm. and the world was very absolutely. different for her in because the environment changed. Like, yeah. Because the environment changed exactly, yeah. but in the UK, what she was and what she she was very very young, right. So we can all make foolish mistakes in our 20s, but how much more foolish and how bigger are the stakes when you come from the kind of space that you came from? And I think we have to be clear about that. It's easy to make silly mistakes when you're in a yeah. position where the stakes are low, but when you make silly right. mistakes and the stakes are very high, then suddenly exactly. you know, your life is spinning out of control and you're in prison or you're dead or, you know, like all sorts of things come into play that most of us don't have to deal with every day. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay with saying, you know, she had a really small set of options. She didn't have a lot of opportunities to thrive, to make good choices. We don't know anything like, I don't think we learned anything about her experience at school, right? We don't think she had a good teacher who, uh, often it's right. one teacher to look one out teacher to, you, to, to. Yeah. You know, it doesn't seem like she had that. That was her choice, her chance. And so she, like, what chances did she really have? She's a young person, young people need guidance. And she absolutely didn't get it. And there was a lot more going on too with the drug scene so so that in itself was was um I, I don't think people are I, i'm trying not to be judgmental in saying this but i don't think people are in the best frame of mind to judge or to have good judgment when <laughs> when they are you know permanently stoned um that <laughs> i don't think two of them go together right so uh, but 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 interestingly once the environment changed, still smoking weed, but just a different vibe, right? So, so you know, the, the, the city drug culture and the, the, you know, smoking the weed and so on in a London scenario versus that in a tropical Jamaican setting, it just seems to be a different vibe, right? And one seems to be more harmful done in a particular environment than the other. 
Tony, can I come back on that and say, so where does Bristol fit into that? Because I thought that was a really interesting choice to not have it a completely London-centric novel. It stays in the UK after she leaves London. It doesn't go straight to Jamaica. It's not a London or Jamaica. There's a third option almost, right? Why do we think the author makes that choice and what does it mean? But Bristol came in, for me anyway, to to tie the story into that whole uh, slave trade, historic, um, you know, sort of excursions in the novel. Um, so that was one one relationship that I made with with bringing Bristol into the story, um, and also the that similar kind of um, my knowledge of Bristol. Um, Kesso is that, that that similar kind of West Indian vibe happened in Bristol as well as it did in London. There was there was there's a collection of of Jamaicans and other West Indians in Bristol, but um, so it was almost like another enclave. Um, so those, those are my two, well, speculations. Yeah, they're also my speculations as well. Um, I think we'll pick up this conversation <laughs> a few questions down. And I think I know exactly why Paula agreed that Yamaya was the author of her misfortunes, but I'll leave it for now. So Kesu, in your, um, in your in your answer, you mentioned that Yamaya changes when she gets to Jamaica. Does Yamaya have an idealized vision of Jamaica? And if so, what do you think accounts for it? I mean, from, from my perspective, I see this as being, a, a, as Tony mentioned earlier, a generation after the, the first arrivals of the Windrush generation. These are people who were British through and through, born born on mainland Britain, um, whose vision of home, vision of Jamaica, was through popular culture, through the reggae scenes, the the the, the life at the crypt, etc. And so, I could see her vision of Jamaica being developed through a yearning for home, and also being exposed to an environment where migrants face the not even migrants because they were british where the jamaican um, population in on, and the caribbean population in britain was facing rampant racism um and, and and other social ills so it's quite easy for her to have an idealized vision of home even though she didn't truly know what home was anyone else i don't mind um riffing off that yeah um so there's a couple of things i'd say I think this novel in particular is concerned with a very particular type of social alienation of a young woman. Um, it's a nice counterpiece, I think, to Alex Wheatle's Brixton Rock, which is kind of a, takes us kind of a similar point of view, a young man in foster care, doesn't know his family, and is similarly building an identity through youth culture, um, pretty much at the same time, um, but much more firmly located in inner city Brixton and its Caribbean communities there. Um, I think Fire Rush, takes a similarly, yeah, I think that's, that, that means that their, their vision of the Caribbean is formed by external factors, whereas I think most children of migrants have a vision that's informed by their immediate family and those experiences that they, that, and the stories and the memories that they have, rather than only through the youth culture that they, that they live through, um, is what I would say is probably important to point out. Um, she doesn't have that because of her family situation, but for many people they come from, whether stable or unstable, they come from they're more anchored to a broader community, whether that's an extended family or whatever. The other thing about idealization is that if you're facing intense oppression, yeah, you are gonna imagine there's another place where you belong, and that place is a happy place. <laughs> Just simply put, right? You're not you're not thinking about all of the problems that that place might have, about the people that live there every day, uh, that you don't live every day, uh, and and the ways that they interact, and the and the place that they occupy in the world stage, and the problems and the issues that those institutions and those places have. Um, you're going to think about how there's a place where the prime minister looks like you, where the minister for education looks like you, where the teachers and the lawyers and the doctors all look like you, and where the fact that you look the way you look isn't going to be a disadvantage. And that sounds like heaven when you're somewhere where the way you look simply is disadvantage enough. Um, so yeah, I think and there is an idealization. Go on. Would you say that um, Yamaya's parents would have the same idealized vision of Jamaica because my thinking is that the people who left on left 
during that Windrush generation, they thought that, as the song says, London is the place for me to better my life, but Jamaica or, or Trinidad or say Kits and Nevis, wherever is still home. So do you think they would also have an idealized vision of the Jamaica that they left 20 or 30 years ago? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Because they leave, I mean, a lot of the time they leave a pre-independence Caribbean, right? So that brings with its tensions, right? They, they remember Jamaica with, oh, a Caribbean that has an upcoming kind of black pride. There's a there's an excitement about the future, right? There's a lot of hope, even though they've skipped it out because they've obviously left and come to England for their sins. Um, but also you don't have, in, in, particularly in the case of Jamaica, as this novel so it's centered on, this is a Jamaica that her parents were left behind before the massive crime waves, right? Before the rise of kind of everything that happens in the late 70s or after that. So they do have that. They remember a much more peaceful Jamaica uh, a, a, where gun culture isn't a thing, where gangs aren't a thing, where, you know, they're going to remember. And often they come from the countryside. So it's even more kind of, you know, this isn't the harder they come. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a different Jamaica from the one that that is later the Jamaica that... Um, they're going to know because that's, that's not the Jamaica they know. That's not the Jamaica they grew up in. Um, and so they will, that's another element of the idealization. Um, and whether they stay in touch with their family members is going to, I think, determine a lot as to whether or not, and not just their family members, but community diasporic organizations can sometimes be very involved in what's going on back home. And sometimes individual people can be less involved. So some people would have known that Jamaica was changing, and other people might be clinging on to their childhood memories and passing those memories down to their children. So their children have these very particular memories that don't reflect contemporary Jamaica and they're completely cut off from it. Although perhaps with the youth culture, that's different as well. It's, it's, I feel like I've become an expert on the diaspora and I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you. But, but it's conflicting though, because you, you've got people migrating and so they are going to better their lives, right? So the assumption is that they're moving from a country where opportunities and so on are limited, okay? And they're escaping poverty as well. Um, they go to the, the metropole or whatever you want to call it, and they find that, you know, the racism, the undue hardships and so on. So they start to remember the pleasant things about, about home, okay? Um, but the things that they, they, they escape from still exist as well, um, with, without a shadow of a doubt, you know? So th there's always conflict. Um, yes. They, they they get nostalgic for the curry goat and the manish water and all that sort of thing um but but yet i have seen with people who return the levels of frustration that they have eh, with with things that don't happen as fast as uh, you know <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know what the answer is um guess of all um, I think, but I, I'm I think sure Paul is relating to what I'm saying. talking about. Yeah. I, think, I think we can, I think this time we go to another novel that we've read, right? The Island of Forgetting. Jasmine Seedy's, I think, points to this when she tells us who migrates and who doesn't, right? A lot of the people that choose to migrate are the people that are not going to be the new middle class. They're not going to reap the fruits of independence in quite the same way. They come from poor places that are going to stay poor for a long time after they leave. And so they individually get out. But if they had stayed, they wouldn't have had the opportunities of of the people that become the leaders, right? So you're but their I'm, children I am privileged go and Paul back was privileged. You know, we didn't migrate, we, we stayed. So <laughs> by your by your argument, your logic, I, I born into some privilege that I didn't know. No, no, I, no, but I, think, I think the people that migrate, they are largely going to be the people that aren't going to make it, right? But their children have a different set of opportunities be, partly because of that migration. So when she goes back, she doesn't go back the child of the person that was whoever she was before she left. She goes back from Britain with their big English poems, right? She goes back a returnee. And so it's so she's and, and, and often that means jumping a, 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 a rod on the class ladder. So it, it's it's very complex. Like you say, I'm not answering I haven't got any answers. I'm kind of agreeing a, with you. An interesting aspect of the um of the idealization, well something I found interesting was it was almost religious. Um Jamaica in my well, my my reading of the novel is that Jamaica to Yamaye was a, a a sort of Zion, and you will see there are lots of religious um, references. Um, she speaks, uh, she's the ancestor, you know, an the ancestors. She speaks of the ancestors in a religious way. Um, 
so I, I think there is an almost, yeah, the, the idealization, I think, is a sort of almost a religious um, expression. Uh, yeah, that's, that's how I read it anyway. Yeah, I, I also saw that as well. Um, and even her her constant, well, the author's constant references to the Maroons, um it, it showed it showed a deeper sort of spiritual connection um that she was establishing between um Yame and Jamaica. So what we'll do now is we'll break very briefly to have the reading by Jacqueline Crook, and then when we come back, we'll pick up the conversation. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Jacqueline Crooks, and I'm reading from the first chapter of my novel Fire Rush, and it's a scene from the Crypt Dance Hall. Bodies rippling like seagrass synthesizing air and bass. In a caves of sound, we skank low, spirits high. Drop moves as offerings to the sound boxes, wooden deities of fading voices. The regulars are scattered around. The pillared vaults, rocked by storm sounds, swaying under arches. Some are pressed against the walls, others bubbling in the epicenter, below low have hovering smoke clouds. Strangers pass through, hold position on the edges. There's Eustace, the owner of Dub Stepper's records, skanking next to the decks, one hand behind his back, the other steering the air. And there's Cynthia, the lover's rock queen, with a bronze sprayed afro, who cradles her sagging womb when she sings, rocking to reggae love songs. And Lego, in the middle of the dance floor, two-stepping best he can with his artificial leg, skanking hard, hard, using his walking stick like a spear, firing it into the air, shouting, Mashdan Babylon! Nobody knows if he's lost his mind or found a higher consciousness. Like our men, who lead the marches and rallies, chanting black power over the heads of the cistern. It's lover's rock time and our bodies are ships rolling through smoke and heat, under pressure from treble and bass. I sway in the broiling centre, far from the walls, where men move with mute biological urgency, stabilising themselves with the weight of the women. Thank you for sticking with us. We'll be picking up the conversation. I have a very pointed question. Is Bonassa a monster? <laughs> Absolutely, at least I thought he was. <laughs> I mean, I didn't see anything to indicate that he was not. There was like absolutely nothing redeeming. Just, yeah, just flat out, yes. All right, there's nothing redeeming, Francine, but um, didn't you think there, you could make a case for compassion. He had no, he had a terrible mother. Um, if, if we are, if he is to be believed, because you can't even be sure what to believe about Manasseh. Um, because at one point, his story is that he was raised in a care home. Um, but he does seem to have a lot of mother anger. Um, so, I mean, sometimes people have that kind of anger just because of absence. So, you know, but the fact is that he obviously had just like um, Yamaye, in fact, worse than Yamaye because Yamaye, Yamaye's father was present and she longed for him, even though, and, and when, she, when, she, when she was ill, he, he was compassionate towards her and she really appreciated that. In fact, she said she used to long to be ill because that was when, <laughs> That was when she, he was kind to her. And just from what we know of Manasseh, he didn't even have that. So can't we make a case, just like we're making a case, for judging um, Yamaye um, compassionately? Can't we make the same case for Manasseh? I think nah. for me, the difference is that the choices that Yama, we talked about the fact that she, you know, she was stuck between a rock and a hard place. She didn't have a lot of choice. And so she did what she needed to do. But none of the things that she did were done to hurt people. 
like she didn't hurt people directly with any of her choices, whereas Monasa was definitely hurting her and others. I, I guess for me, that's the difference. And also, I think um, Manasseh, it seems like, has hurt people that, in ways that we don't even aware of, right? There's a sense um, when she's talking to, I think, is it Charmaine? That she's made it longer than the others. Or is it Christine? But one of the female characters suggests that maybe he's killed the previous exes rather than just leaving him. Like, it seems that he's, and I think there's the one part where you can't even trust his story. But also the depth of his ego, it appears that it's not really, you know, we scratch at the surface. We don't know him very well. He's hard to know, but also we feel like whatever is left to know, we don't want to know, right? I think he's he's he, he's definitely presented as the incarnate of evil, and I'm all I love, I love a redemption arc, and I love a redeemable character, and this character seems quite irredeemable. He reminds me to me actually. We were talking earlier about novels that um, we've read that this is similar to, but the only person that he reminded me really strongly of, and they had a very similar fate actually in some ways, is um the partner, the abusive partner in um. Sherry, Sherry Jones. Sherry, yes, I, like this Sherry. novel reminded me of that as well. Yes, um, yes, in many yes. ways, in many, many ways. Absolutely. Um, the, yeah. the, cave, the cave scene being a big right. one. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah. in many ways, it reminded me of how the one armed sister sweeps her house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that cave scene was, was so hauntingly similar, wasn't it? Um, with the, the um, one armed sister. Just, just, just briefly, um, Paula. On the redeemable factor of Malasa, I I, I don't just think he was an outright gangster. Um, just the real deal, you know. That's they don't get more gangster than that. Um, and totally but what admit. creates that? What creates a gangster? You see that like, you all yeah. wax um, you. lyrical. You yeah. all wax lyrical about mm -hmm. um about Yamaya and why we should be compassionate. I don't mm -hmm. see anybody arguing for Manasa. No, I do agree with you. Yeah. With yeah. Ex so especially he, with Francine's point when Francine yeah. said he hurts other people, whereas Yamaya only hurts herself. Correct. Um so I I'm I'm but you know if you all can find so much compassion. No, 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 well, I, 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 I hear so. you I hear you in, in terms of okay in terms of well, the he one, the one what he thing. became hmm. because maybe he had limited choices. He just went along a path that um was he was locked into from from the word go. So um, and he enjoyed it. This is the problem I have. You with get him. the sense, yeah. He, you get that sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like he he took pleasure in hurting others. He took pleasure in that pain that he caused and that chaos that he created. In the but lives then, of other but then, this is a novel about power. Power is a very important concern of this novel, and he is taking power in the only way he knows how. He has only seen power expressed in a way which is destructive. So in his mind, that is what power, that is what power looks like. And he, he is also enamored, he, he's a crook. But when um, Yamaye suggests to him that he's a revolutionary, he grabs that, he, he holds that tightly. And he also, um, he also says that what he is doing essentially is reparation. He's taking back. I'm, I'm just, I, I just tell you what the man said, he's right? Not, he's not he's not he's not that's the only redemption for him. That's the only way his actions can be redeemable, right? It's so amoral the rest of the time that that's the one slit of hope that he has of like being redeemable. If it's if we if we recast him as a Robin Hood revolutionary character um, who's out there stealing back what they took from us, right? Yeah, but he was also he killing was us. Account, so it's not come even on, come on, let's, yeah. let's, be, let's be serious here. He was also killing us. You know, he was also wreaking destruction among his own. So I, 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 I don't know. I, I hear Paula's point, and and I, I think. Listen, I am not advocating for Manasseh. The point I am making is that if we advocate for some people, why can't we advocate for? Every, why can't we say everybody is the um? We, we, like, we like some more than we like others, you know? It's just a question of likability. <laughs> I think what she does with the YMLA is point when people have few choices, they make bad choices or choices that we think create more problems than they solve, right? Whereas I think with Manasa, what we see is that there are some people that enjoy the chaos, that enjoy the pain, that they enjoy the power. 
um, and that and that I think she's talked a lot about. And uh, I say talked a lot about. I think this novel is kind of anchored in some of her own semi autobiographical experiences of gang culture, right? But some people in gangs get drawn in because of their own situations, and other people choose to be a part of the problem. And I think that's what she's getting at with these two characters. That some people are choosing to be there, uh, will will live there till the day they die, quite happily wreaking destruction, creating havoc, being bad people through and through till the day that they're put away or died, right? Right. And others will make a different choice as soon as they get the chance. Because Monasa could have just kept his little tail quiet in London. But did he? No. You know, he had to continue to pursue um, Yamaye. Like, why didn't he just, okay, she's gone, you know. No, he continued. So yeah, he's but, choosing to 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 be this person. And that's what gangs do. It's it's like a <laughs> mafia, you know. You, you don't you don't escape, you know. That's... But but we're assuming that that um, Monasa had choices because was it Charmaine who um, who said not even the story of, um, of his story is true because. On one hand, he was saying he he was raised in a care home, and on the other hand, he was he, he lived with his mother. I think if I if I am it wasn't right Charmaine, right. it was a white girl. I can't remember. It her was name. the yeah, so, the, so, the, yeah. Christine, yeah, Caroline, Christine, something like that. Uh, yeah, whatever her name was. But he yeah. himself he himself let us um let Yamaye know that she would not be safe if she tried to let, to leave him because when yet yeah, when she asked him what happened to the former girlfriend he told her ask me no questions i'll tell you no lies so yeah but he he, he definitely got off on her fear <laughs> i think we could all agree because we, we always tend to look for like the most evil um character in, in in a novel we could probably agree that he's the most evil character um and it seems like most of us agree that he there's no redemption for him. <laughs> I'm not saying I, <laughs> I am not saying I'm not advocating for Manasa. I, I'm just wondering how all you can find so much compassion for other people. I can't find compassion for Manasa. Because we're human. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, is... <laughs> yeah, like Tony said, there are some people you're gonna people. like and uh, <laughs> some people that you just yeah, you're not you don't care about them. So <laughs> so building on the whole point of um Monasa, at one point Yamaye thinking about Monasa says, quoting, I feel repulsion, pity, hatred, confusion, all the things I feel for Irving and Asasi. Does it surprise you that she lumps all three of them together? I was surprised by that. Because she had she had a difficult relationship with Irving. And she had a difficult relationship with that family. But there was love in those relationships. Um, and certainly Astasi, we see, we, see we, we, we witness Astasi being supportive of her occasionally. We see, we witness that same thing with Irving, with Irving being supportive of her sometimes. Um, she also had lo a longer history with the two of them. So I found it very surprising that she would um, lump Irving at, with those other two, um, whom I, I think she genuinely loved them. She, she had a difficult relationship with them, but she did love them. But didn't she make this observation just like after everything, I mean, happened with Assassi? Like, it, this is not an observation that she made when they were still friend, good friends, so to speak. Maybe it's based on everything that happened with Assassi and Eustace. And she, because she came to a realization that in fact, Assassi was not exactly who she thought she was. Like she was a completely different person. She always knew Assassi was not a good person. She always knew that. Because she, very early in the novel, she says, she said she wondered whether she was drawn to Assassi through love or through fear. Because she thought as she'd seen Assassi do terrible things to other people, and she wondered if Assassi would do the same thing to her. So I, I don't know that it's because she had some grand new revelation about Assassi. She knew what who Assassi was. I don't know. I feel like she does have 
or maybe what she does is like you say it's not a brand new revelation but the depths of how you know like when moose is alive one of the things he says to her is you're really different without your friends and i think that that, that and that's kind of left there to hang a little bit like what does that mean and she realizes she's happier she's she, and she also feels more like herself you know she can't be fully herself with the people that are supposedly her friends like the, and, and i remember it struck me really intre- like it's really strange early on when she says you know i don't want people in our business um and it's like people your friends are your these are your girls like how are they people but then you as the friendship unravels you kind of see that actually there's always been a level of transaction in their relationship or or maybe that transaction not the right word but a level of disconnect you know there's a level of distance even when they're spending so much time together um because she can't fully be herself and i wonder if she makes all three of those people force her to be small and and prevent her growth and that's why she says they're the same that they all kind of force her into a box that she doesn't want to be and they kind of imprison her in different ways um and that's why she's like the, the, a, a kind of i realize it's the same feeling and like you, and i think we've talked about how manasseh is the demon of the tale but to be fair to him she he saves her when she needs it that's how it all happens and we can see now afterwards he's a total predator he sees her as vulnerable and absolutely gets his claws into her but at the time where she absolutely needs someone he's the person who turns up and when she needs someone to go she feels safe going to him you know it all kind of falls apart later but yeah but that's big... that's that's a spider on the web i mean that's typical coming to my parlor said the spider to the fly right um <laughs> i'm not impressed by that um guess or the fact that, that that she's running from a situation and, and he he appears and and he's her savior in the moment and and then uh his predatory uh attributes take over um no, sorry it's not, I, it's not, I, it's not, it's not the predator ever. she hasn't lived as long as us she's a young girl you know she has to make she has to realize that for herself right yeah you said you said something earlier Kesua, about um yami is saying i don't want other i don't want people to be in my business i think part part of that is that love was something that yamaye was not familiar with and she said so much she, she said it in so many words you know she said she was she she, she told most i I'm, I'm not used to this and i think part of the not wanting to invite people into that is that she didn't know what to make of it herself and she may also not have trusted it because she had never known a pure love before I think it was surprising because while there were similarities in the relationships that Yama shared with these um individuals, I don't I don't I don't think there was complete equivalence um uh, uh, between them. Uh because for example, Yamaya's relationship with Monasa is rooted and 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 had its origin in physical abuse, uh in 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 sexual abuse, as a matter of fact. Whereas her relationship with Irving, while Irving was a, a terrible parent, there were still moments of of tenderness that were present. Whereas the relationship that she shared with Monasa, the moments of tenderness were just moments of passionate intimacy. I don't think that was true love or anything. It was just passionate intimacy that was skewed uh, unfairly to um, to Monasa's pleasure. I don't. I don't think Yamaye was 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 absolutely in love with um, Monasa, or enjoyed that relationship. It was more in 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 um, Monasa's favor. But to speak to what you said, Ralji, yeah, the you know what she suffered with Irving and even Asasi was different to what she suffered with Monasa. But I feel trauma is trauma, and the way that it manifests itself in the body, the body can't tell the difference necessarily between it coming from physical trauma or emotional trauma. And that's probably where the similarity that she felt with those three relationships come came from. It's like that's what her body was feeling. Like she, wasn't is, also, she wasn't yeah. intellectually analyzing it, right? It was just how it made her how they made her feel. Yeah, and we don't we don't we don't uh, we're not intellectual about our emotions. You know, you feel what you feel. And it, it, it's not, very often it's not logical. So, yeah. So I think we have time for one last question. If you had to choose one or the other, 
as a description of this novel, would you say it is a cautionary tale or story of redemption? <laughs> I think more a story of redemption. I don't, I suspect the, the kind of human being that Yamaye is, if she's the kind of person who will not regret the fact that she has gone through the experiences that she had. She will, she's not the kind of person who will say, I wish I hadn't done that. She will, she's the kind of person who will say, I did it. It caused me some pain. I, there are lessons I can take from that. And um, I, I don't, the story is not told in a mood of regretfulness. It's, to, it, it acknowledges that these horrible things happened, but it's not saying, oh my God, I was an idiot. Well, wait, she does go through that. She does say, she does blame herself, but I don't think, I don't think she's the kind of person who will think that um, her life was wasted because she made these choices. I think she w she's the kind of person who will just take what she learned from those experiences and you know, focus on what what is positive, what the positive things that she could she could draw out of it. I, I agree with Paula. I, I I see her learning as she went along, definitely. Um, and I mean, let's remember her age, and she was she's she's this young woman who's actualizing. Through diff difficult circumstances, very, very difficult circumstances. Um, and she does become um, resilient. She does become someone, I'm left with the impression of it, um, firmly stands on her feet. Uh, I got, I left the novel with, with that sort of feeling of confidence that Yame is going to be okay. Um, and so, so I see the redemptive theme more prevalent than than a cautionary team theme yeah i i agree there as well um i think i think this this novel left a lot of room uh for redemption um not only of yamaye but it left room for a redemption of, of several characters even the, the sort of reunification if i could call it that of yamaye and asasi um where um, Asase finds out, not, not Asase, Yamaye finds out that there's a potential that, was it the the letters from um, Asase were being hidden? I might have gotten that wrong. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think... The visiting I, yeah, orders. That's right. The visiting, the visiting, orders. The, the visiting yeah. orders, yeah. Order. The visiting right. orders. Yeah, when she finds out that um, those were being um, potentially hidden. That um, was not think, clear though, because um, Yamaye did mm, say I, she wasn't sure if Asase was not telling her the truth. Correct, right. correct. So, it really yeah. wasn't clear. It wasn't clear mm -hmm. whether clear. those letters were yeah, actually it written. Was, it, yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, it was not clear. That yeah, that is true. Um, but I, I still saw redemption there um, the, because even if um, Asase was lying, <laughs> I think she was lying with the hope that the, the relationship would be fixed. Um, I saw redemption for Asase in that scene as well because she was truthful about what happened with her, between her and Yusuf. She could have continued to lie, or she could have made it look like um, you know. She, the, the fact is that she was honest about it, and and that I thought was was you know something re um, redemptive. Definitely. All right, I think that's about all the time that we have. So the next time the viewers see us, we'll be interviewing Jacqueline Crooks on her debut novel Fire Rush. Thank you for joining us, and have a lovely day.